I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This summer, the nation and the state celebrate the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, a time we reflect on the civil rights movement, uh, the work of the pioneers, those who struggled, who uh, laid down life and limb to fight for the rights of our people to change America. One of the institutions that came from that valiant struggle, ongoing struggle, is the Freedom School. I'm pleased today to have one of the leaders of the present-day Freedom School movement on the program. Dr. Reverend Darcel Hill is the director of the Freedom School of St. Paul. Uh, Dr. Hill, good morning and welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited about being here. Freedom Schools, uh, talk about that story. How did they uh, come about and uh, what purpose did they serve in our community? Okay, Freedom Schools came about as a result of the Civil Rights Movement back in 1964. It was a program under the leadership of Ella Baker and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. These were people who gathered the young people to begin the series of learning how to do the nonviolent protests, how to work together as a team to get things done, and to develop the courage that was needed to fight against the status quo and the segregationists to make sure that justice and equality was available for all people, particularly African Americans, who were disenfranchised down in Mississippi and down south. And they also wanted to work to begin to create a structure that was based on equality and breaking down the Jim Crow laws uh, and segregation there. So, Reverend, uh, how did we start Freedom School here in Minnesota? How did your program start in particular? Well, in 1997, Reverend Gloria Roach Thomas was working through the St. Paul Area Council of Churches, as well as Howard Root in Minneapolis Public Schools and Phyllis Sloan. And they wanted to begin to bring Freedom Schools to the Twin City area. So they talked to Jim Koppel at the time, who was the CEO of the Children's Defense Fund Minnesota in bringing the program here. So together they got together and Children's Defense Fund Minnesota provided the seed money for us to start Freedom Schools back in 1997. And so what are you doing and where are you? Uh, describe your program here in Minnesota. In Minnesota, what's a blessing to me is that the St. Paul Public Schools Superintendent Silva decided to sponsor Freedom Schools in St. Paul. Over the years, when we worked with the St. Paul Area Council of Churches, we were very small. Mm -hmm. We were a seed, but that continued to grow, and we were primarily in, in church basements. And we were very grateful for the Mount Olivet Baptist Church for hosting our Freedom School for four years. And um, over the time, it, we began to see that the children who were involved in the Freedom Schools Actually, the following school year began to increase in proficiency in reading and math at a higher rate than their peers. And as you know, African Americans are the subgroup that has the lowest proficiency in reading and math in St. Paul, other than special ed. So when they began to see these, this growth in the academics of the children, we, we began to see growth in the parent involvement in their children's lives and with their education, we began to see this positive esteem that our children had in their own identity as African Americans, and that they began to incorporate the theme, I can and must make a difference in myself, my family, my community, my country, my world, with hope, education, and action. They began to embody that that um, they began to make a difference in schools. 
So a lot of times we had children who people had labeled as bad mm -hmm. with behavior issues, um, actually coming, becoming leaders. And we see them growing from elementary school, going on to high school, graduating, going on to college, and coming back volunteering in the community. And they began to graduate from college and began to make a difference. But the wonderful thing in all of that was that we had a primary pipeline through education where we had a lot of the young black men deciding that they wanted to be educators and working towards that. And over time, we began to see the school district actually recruiting those young men and women into the school district to serve and that they are really persevering through getting their teaching license. Some of them are working as administrators even now and elected officials. And they all account that and contributed to the Freedom Schools and what it brought to them and their esteem and their academics, their pers persevering through the various disparities that we face as a community and making a difference. And it started with themselves first and then it, it, then it began to spread as a movement. Let me get your personal story, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hill, Reverend Hill. Uh, I appreciate and I love the passion that you bring, and I obviously um, have great appreciation, as our entire community does, for the work of the Freedom Schools, the important work of educating our young. It's so critical. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful that there's an environment that embraces uh, the sense of dignity and the sense of uh, uh, potential uh, that you uh, use to invite uh, quality response from children, right? And so, where does it come from in you? What's your personal story? How did you come to this work? Well, as a young person, my parents were very involved in the community, and I belonged to a church, a missionary Baptist church, Macedonia uh, Missionary Baptist Church, and we always had urban programming, educational programming, and we began to be very active with the NAACP. And from that, we learned about advocacy, we learned about the importance of civil rights, the importance of knowing who we are as um, affirming our culture. So that's where my roots came from. What town? Where were you from? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Okay. But I was a mother, a teenage mother. I was a mother at 18. And it was very important to me that education was the route that got me out of poverty. Hmm. You know, when you're young, that young and starting out uh, being on welfare, uh, food stamps, the various issues and disparities as a, a young mother growing up, I had so many people that were helping me that were part of the community. Mm -hmm. They were my role models. They encouraged me. They told me that I could do it. When circumstances said no, they said, yes, you can. And so my motto is, if I can help somebody, then my living is not in vain. So that started it. Also, I'm a mother of two sons. And I saw the system that was um, not very conducive to my son's own self-esteem as black men. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember that my son had issues, my younger son had issues with reading, and he was mandatory for him to go to summer school, but I knew his creativity, his, um, his intelligence, that he would create mischief, yeah. to be honest. And I did not want him in an environment where other people did not want to be there. And so someone told me about Freedom School. And I began to take a look at that and I enrolled him in Freedom School. This boy had been labeled as having ADHD. He had problems with authority because he thought outside of the box. He began to shut down in school because it, he was being labeled as this bad boy. But I saw a transformation in him in Freedom School. Hmm. First of all, the chants and cheers in Freedom School, there are actually positive affirmations that he was saying to himself and about himself every day. I am a great somebody. I can make a difference. Um, the whole thing about unity and coming together as a community to support each other began to transform him that even after that first summer, when he went back to school, his academics improved. Hmm. Because of the integrated reading curriculum that was culturally affirming, he saw himself 
doing great things. He learned about great leaders like Martin Luther King and like Thurgood Marshall from the eyes of a child and from a perspective of when they were children, those things that molded and made their lives. He said, you know what? I can make a difference. And I remember he was still having behavior issues. But when I came up there one day, he looked at me. He said, Mom, don't worry no more. I'll take care of my business. You see, I'm a great somebody. You keep teaching me. You keep pa being patient with me. And you will watch me rise to the top. And I'm looking at him like, what? 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 <laughs> but then I found out that was a freedom school chant that uh, he was saying. Mm -hmm. And so all these things he was saying to me, singing something inside so strong. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that I can make it. And I began to see a transformation in him. And over time, he became one, volunteering in the community, volunteering in, in Freedom School, making great grades, graduating. So that bad boy became um, earned a four-year academic scholarship to the University of Minnesota, graduated, and is still giving back. And so that's my story. When I began to see all of our children who were elementary with their pigtails playing, and I see their eyes brighten. I see them catching it, that I see them overcoming the negative stereotypes about African Americans and other people of color in the media, and that they begin, uh, they start coming to life, coming to life. That's what gives me the, the motivation to continue with this work. And then you see young people who started with the program at 18 years old, growing up to be fine men and women, graduating from college, and, and even changing their degree, their, their majors to go into education. And I see that all the time. And some of the men said, oh, we were knuckleheads when we were young. Mm -hmm. But I see that the difference that we're making in these children, and they want to be educators too, and they, they love their work. And we have been continuing since then together in developing the Freedom School programming and developing partners and developing you know, partnerships with the community because it does take a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. So when you bring parents together, community together, young people together, and um, with a single mission to support the children, to celebrate great them, letting them know that their culture, their language is fine. Mm -hmm. You have made great contributions to this world and we see the difference. And that's what the superintendent saw over the years. And that when every time we were being told no more freedom school. It was the parents who wrote the letters and the phone calls and the uh, St. Paul Public Schools began to pour more and more resources in till one day the superintendent said, you know, we want to do freedom school. That's amazing. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll continue in a minute. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reverend Darcel Hill, director of the Freedom School of St. Paul. A great and inspirational story. I want to talk about how the school district responded to both the challenges and the opportunities and talk about this whole idea of capturing, acknowledging our creativity, our genius, and our guests that join us after this break will focus on those two areas. Stay tuned. Africa. McFarland, welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. A, a great conversation about education uh, in our community. I'm pleased that we have Julie Schultz Brown. She's the Communications and Marketing Development Director uh, in the Office of Communications, Marketing, and Development at St. Paul Public Schools. Also joining me in this conversation, in fact, the, the one who motivated the conversation is uh, my new friend, Andre Fisher. Andre Fisher is um, uh, the head of the St. Paul Jazz Mobile. 
at, at Twin Cities Mobile Jazz Project. Okay, I'll get it right. Twin Cities Mobile. That's what it says on the paper here, too. I don't mind <laughs> saying it. Okay. <laughs> Twin Cities Mobile Jazz Pro Project. He's former Dean of Music Industries at the McNally Smith College of Music, has a great and storied career in the music industry. Uh, Julie, first to you. Uh, I am inspired by uh, Reverend Dr. Darcel Hill's testimony. That's what it's I call mind. this. This is a testimony, it's, it's a mind. statement of uh, truth and reality about the power of affirming our personhood, our dignity, and believing that our children uh, have great value and will rise to the occasion. And so it's wonderful for me to understand that the district values this energy, this impetus as well. And this fits really tightly with uh, the major vision okay. of the St. Paul Public Schools. Talk about that if you will. The major vision, strong schools, strong communities, is has aligned with three different goals that almost any employee in the district can tell you about. Uh, achievement, alignment, sustainability. Those three goals came out of a deep research project, re, deep research that the superintendent instigated, where we found out after a, um, we found out that our black and brown kids, didn't matter where they went to school, across town or wherever, what, no matter what kind of school they went to, they they weren't achieving at the rates that they should be achieving at. And something had to change because 80% of our kids are kids of color. And St. Paul's quality of life depends on whether we're educating the kids, the kids that are in our schools right now. So Superintendent Silva put together this strategic plan, Achievement Alignment Sustainability, where we would, the goal is higher achievement for all students, aligning our resources to make that happen, and in making sure that we have the resources to, to, to meet our goals. That was... 2011, April 2011. That was three years of putting that infrastructure in place. Um, we've made a lot of changes over the last three years. Um, students and families have been very patient. They've worked very hard. We've moved kids to different schools. We've brought more kids closer to home in their schools. And it's been very successful. What we're doing now is going deeper. And the foundation of our work is around racial equity and understanding that we all do better when we all do better. This isn't that there's not enough for everyone. That means that all kids get what they need, what the equitable resources that they need. Freedom Schools aligns beautifully with all the sub-goals of achievement, alignment, and sustainability. It aligns with racial equity work. It aligns with personalized learning, which is all about meeting the student where they're at, engaging them in, in ways that, that blows their hair back. Um, it aligns with getting ready for college and career because it's all about um, literacy in the freedom schools. It also aligns with um, uh, pathways, career uh, pathways for schools on making sure that every student has an opportunity to have challenging classes mm -hmm. and that it has an opportunity to be in culturally relevant classes, cl classes that, is, that are going to engage them and not seem irrelevant, like many of some of our classes have seen. And ultimately, it also aligns with, with um, systems of support, which is our fifth goal, because it's all about getting a, an exceptional workforce, and in some cases, and to some to some extent, that's going to mean having teachers who look like our kids. It's not to say that a, a white person can't be an exceptional student for a child of color, but there has to be a cultural awareness mm -hmm. of how different students learn in different ways and trying to meet those students at that place. So Freedom Schools is... I mean, this strategic plan and freedom schools are closely aligned. And so when you look at the, uh, the results of the studies you did, mm -hmm. what conclusions uh, were, were arrived at as to the reason for the failures? Have we, have we categorized where we went wrong as a community, not St. Paul, but society? What happened that schools were not producing the results that we all uh, mutually desired for children and families? I don't know that there is one answer, mm -hmm. and I think if I had it, I would be on a throne right now because <laughs> that's the silver bullet everyone's looking for, mm -hmm. and there isn't a silver bullet. Mm -hmm. But we do know that we have to have high expectations for all of our children, and part of doing that, part of, of ensuring those high expectations is that every person in St. Paul Public Schools examines the role of race mm -hmm. in their lives, their understanding of race, and in how race affects the work they do with the children in St. Paul Public Schools. That's one thing that we know is a foundational element. We believe and know. I, I don't know if we know it because we haven't seen the scores go up the way we want them to. At this point, they're inching up. Grad rates are doing beautifully. We've had great, and I have the, the information here for you. The grad rates 
and the achievement gap between white kids and African-American kids was significantly reduced over this last year. So we're, we feel we're on the right track. Um, other achievement goals have been inching up, and so we're hopeful that this is absolutely, absolutely the right way. I don't say, think we can say any one thing went wrong. It's a very complex system. When you put together the legislature and unions and administration and parents who care so deeply about these babies, you have so many different opinions and so many strong opinions that I don't know that one thing, you can blame one thing. Andre, let me ask you to jump in here. You uh, have uh, been uh, a teacher uh, through what you've done with the McNally Smith College of Music, uh, administrator, teacher. Yeah. Also, uh, I was an instructor at USC, uh -huh. University of Southern California. Okay. And, uh, and now you're doing the same thing in a different way by the Twin Cities uh, Mobile Jazz Project. Talk about that, first of all. Then I'm going to ask you a question about how this connects. Well, first of all, uh, they say amateurs uh, borrow and professionals steal. Uh, it's the, the Mobile Jazz Project is basically an emulation of the jazz mobile from Dr. Billy Taylor in, 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 this, in New York City. He did this in Harlem in 1964, trying to create a jazz renaissance amongst people of color to let them know that your culture is not for sale and that it's something to be shared and not necessarily bought. So uh, basically what he did is he got a flatbed truck and he'd pull it in the middle of a brownstone neighborhood, cordon off the ends of the streets, and put Duke Ellington or Dizzy Gillespie or Miles Davis on the truck. Well, needless to not say... Not the record, the real guy. The real the musician, yeah. yeah. And, and you got to remember that children and most people who don't go to clubs or... or pay for entertainment or go to somewhere late at night would never see these people other than on record. Mm -hmm. So they were able to see the, these uh, icons of, of jazz and, and also understand that it's an American art form. Uh, it, it's, it's not uh, just for your listening pleasure. It, that with art, histology, mystology, all different forms of culture make the kind of person you are. Uh, my parents gave me music not to be a professional musician, but that with uh, uh, between National Geographic and, and partially being homeschooled was to enlighten me, was to make me worldly, and, and maybe one day I would contribute to humanity. Uh, so with, with the mobile jazz, Dr. Taylor not only was trying to, uh, um, to bring jazz back to the community, he was trying to get a little critical thinking in there. He was trying to get some questions asked. And he was also showing that the history of the music, through each change from ragtime to, to Dixieland to cool jazz, birth of the cool with Miles Davis, socioeconomic things were happening with people of color but Americans, period, through each change in the musical sphere. So in other words, it's, it's, it's linked. Uh, what we do off time is, as far as our lives are concerned, is connected. Uh, it's like having one attitude for downtown and one for your neighborhood. Uh, you, you find that uh, with most entertainers I deal with, I always ask them if your record doesn't sell, who were you before you, you made the record? You have to be someone before you, you, you worry about accomplishments and, and who thinks you're successful. Back to Billy Taylor, the, the, the truck, what it did is it, it brought jazz to the boroughs of New York, but what it did is it created a safety zone. The, the borough presidents started giving him money because they were spending less money for police, and crime went down. And all of a sudden, little gangbangers thought it was okay now to carry a trumpet in a case and to go play in a band. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it became respectable, part of our culture, which we took for granted, then became respect respectable, but also viewed just like we view concert music or ballet dancers, something that's uh, uh, sophisticated. Uh, and uh, because you got to remember that in America, in, in the 1900s, 20s, 30s, and 40s, black music was called race music. Right. And not only that, but country music was even alternative. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that had to do with your socio socioeconomic station for one thing, and jazz was considered Al Jolson singing Mammy. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's like Pat Boone covering a Little Richard record. Mm -hmm. So until we were able to share, going to my Christian ethic, 
then it was it was all a bunch of confusion. Everything is confused until people learn that in order to enjoy it, whatever it is, it has to be shared. So in essence, what Mr. Taylor did is he starts sharing. And then he, he was a disc jockey in Manhattan. He was a popular disc jockey and also a, a noted pianist. He wound up buying this radio station that he was a disc jockey on. So that became his woolly pulpit for his mobile jazz. And to this day, after his passing in 2010, the Jazzmobile and that organization in New York is used as the broker by the school systems to, to have the Jazzmobile bring culture to their schools, okay? And, and also with workshops. And he found that it wasn't enough just to play and to have the masters on stage. That turned into a workshop for adults and children on the weekends because they didn't have the parks that we have. You know, a brownstone, a hot in the summertime in Spanish Harlem is totally different than Lake Calhoun or over at Lake Harriet. So in essence, what I've done is transpose that to our location with with our neighborhoods. And we're, we're very culturally adept in this town. There's so many events and, and different things happening here that we can partake of during the summer. But not all of them are aimed specifically at children or children of color, whether it be popular music. My goal is not to play music in the parks. My goal is the music is a cinnamon roll, and I need to put a vitamin in it. The music is the reason to get you there, and it's something to be proud of. It's part of our culture, but it's just a piece of the story that has to make a, a, a creative thinker. And it's about exposure. I used to think bookcases in my home were yellow because my father had all these National Geographics. I said, why do I have to read all these? He said, because when you go to Paris, I want it to seem like deja vu. Mm -hmm. And in essence, he said, you can't be a citizen of the world uh, uh, unless you, you open your mind up. He said, neighborhoodly things will get neighborhoodly results. Mm -hmm. And he said, that may be okay if it's giving you all the things you need. But if not, you have to go outside of whatever your resources are or the box that you think in mm -hmm. to be able to be more of an enlightened human being. Mm -hmm. And and not only with, with uh, uh, people of color going to college and trying to prepare kids for, for, for better things. I had a child come up to me in the park. And he actually thought democracy was the ability to buy something. Okay, and, and that's been the problem, which I wanted to mention when you were speaking, is that also, too, with black people or people of color, that they've spent now a lot of time trying to assimilate. And that assimilation doesn't necessarily give them identity. The assimilation is towards values and not necessarily a culture, because the culture changes every 15 minutes based upon what makeup you wear, what car you drive, and what neighborhood you live in. That deeper one, that when we say, oh, we're going over to Chinatown, or we're going to Koreatown, or we're going to Little Italy, those are places where the people have, wherever they came from, part of that culture is still part of what they do. If you see a Japanese movie, and there's this, a brand new movie where there's this space Avenger, and he's wearing a space suit, you look down and he's still got a samurai sword. It's like, if you got a laser, what's the deal with the sword? That's still the connection to the culture. Everything they do still is connected. And, and at times here in America, it, I feel that sometimes Afro-Americans or whatever we're calling ourselves these days are neither American nor African. Uh, and sometimes to assimilate in the values of the people who enslaved you sometimes doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm trying to be like the people my parents warned me about. And it's not a people or the man. The man is a system. Mm -hmm. And the system can be run by anybody. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it doesn't have a color. It has a devaluation of, of self and of sharing. And of humanity. And of humanity. So <laughs> in, in essence, that's what I need to put back as a father. I have five children. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to put back with the mobile jazz is put some humanity back in our in our culture 
and at the same time expose these children. One child who was 11 years old came on stage at Harrison Park last year. He didn't know what the upright bass was, the electric piano, or, or a conga drum. He truthfully didn't know what they were. Well, when we were children, we all had somebody who took piano lessons, tap lessons. You, you know, you didn't have to, you had to come find me for dinner. I was outside. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people talk about back in the day, but back in the day could have been four years ago. Can we jump in? Well, and back in the day, our schools expected to graduate 50% of the kids. They didn't necessarily expect to graduate African American. We really, our school system hasn't really changed. Going back to you saying what went wrong, we're doing the same thing we've been doing. Mm -hmm. We have to do something different now. Our expectations are different. We have to decide it was wrong. Right. That's number one. Right. Admit that it was wrong. Right. That, that's, that, that's, that's my total premise. Mm -hmm. premise. Right. Mm -hmm. In other words, I can't go on in the same way. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. here I am, I've been very successful in music, mm -hmm. but the success came from content. Mm -hmm. And the, the money was ancillary. So in other words, even at this point, uh, for most of the professionals that I came up with, you can't pay us to do what we do. You can pay us for our time. Mm -hmm. But in creation or in critical thought, you can't pay me to be smart. Either that's my nature or it's not. Or to go into a class and know which one is a is an audio learner, which one is kinesthetic, you know, which one which one it doesn't is not going to adhere to the teacher. But if you know where they're at, you can do something to have them learn. Mm -hmm. And also, if part of my education wasn't in school. My father told me, he said, there will be no school that can fully educate you the way in which I can. And he said, I don't hold institutions responsible for the well-being of my children. He said, I hold myself responsible. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me take a break. I'm Al okay. McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll continue in a minute. Uh, a fascinating conversation. I want to get to the question of partnerships. Uh, you've got a partnership with the St. Paul Public Schools. You, with the Freedom School, have a partnership with public schools, and you all are partnering together. How do we make that happen, create more of that, and generate the benefit, the sense of equity uh, that individuals and families need to have in order to make their personal and family, and therefore our community lives successful. So stay tuned, be right back. McFarland, and welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. My guests today are Reverend Dr. Darcel Hill, who's Executive Director of the St. Paul Freedom School, and Andre Fisher. He is Director of the Twin Cities Mobile Jazz Project, former Dean of Music Industries at McNally Smith College of Music, and Julia Julie Schultz Brown, who's Communications Director for the St. Paul Public Schools. We're talking about partnerships. And it's critical and important and apparent that there is a partnership capacity with the institution. Uh, you called it the 500-pound gorilla, right? Or uh, this huge organization, St. Paul Public Schools, and its ability to work with smaller organizations like yours, the Jazz Project, or like the Freedom School. Andre, why are partnerships important from your point of view? And what's been your experience in trying to create a relationship that makes sense for you and the mission that you uh, are pursuing? Well, if the partnership is correct, it, it makes strength. And if both people uh, have a, a positive purpose, you've doubled it. You know, and to be able to work in coalition with people, that that's what they do every day. You know, and, and that makes a difference too. Uh, for me, um, I judge strength or leadership by people lead by example. 
So the reason why I wanted to be a community partner with the St. Paul Public Schools, and especially uh, knowing people like uh, uh, you know Tyrese Cox and Jackie Turner mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. John Peterson, uh, and even uh, Gene Ward, uh, who I'm working with now, um, their whole routine uh, as part of the whole had to do with leading by example. And no one wants to date the girl to somebody ask her to the prom. So for me as a fledgling nonprofit organization that's trying to do things in the community, I need a 500 pound gorilla. And to me that's the school system because the nature of that system means it has a lot of things to deal with. That's what I mean when I say mm -hmm. uh, the weight mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned. But also I'm proud to stand as a partner with that organization if I feel that it's properly leading, and I think that it is. So that was important for me to do that, and also to make my organization aligned with one that was doing the same thing I'm doing, and that's thinking about children. I didn't get a chance to ask you to tell your story. Uh, let me digress a bit, because you've got a great uh, personal story. I think it's fascinating. Talk about your history. You're a native of St. Paul. Uh, you know what? We visited St. Paul. My mother's water broke while she was singing on stage with me at, at the Lakeview Club. Uh, that's how I was born here. And my dad was going to a conservatory which no longer exists. Uh, that's why they were here. Uh, I was, also, I lived in Omaha, Nebraska, Kansas City, Chicago, and New York as a child. It was almost like an army brat. My dad was with Stan Kenton, Woody Herman, and with Harry James, with big band and my mom sang with uh, Preston Love and Peg Leg Bates Review. And that's when Judy Perkins was here, and Rook Gans, and Oscar Pettiford, and uh, a lot of great musicians were here in town at that time. Uh, that's when Howdy Doody was live, and that's when Excelsior Park was open, and Axel's Treehouse was on TV, and Mel Jazz mm -hmm. was the popular uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, news reporter. So that's those, going way back. Yeah. Those are the times I came from. Mm -hmm. And then uh, basically, I left in the third, going to the fourth grade. Um, and we moved to Los Angeles. My father and my uncle decided they were going to make that their headquarters. So I went to uh, uh, finished elementary, junior high, and high school there. But from four to the age of nine. Uh, I travel with my father every summer. It was easier for me to travel with my uh, dad than it was my mom. By the time I was nine, I'd been to all the states and about four countries. Um, at the age of five, I was what they call a band boy, same age of my youngest son, where they'd give me a list of the songs for that night, and I'd go in big steamer trunks and pull out the arrangements for each person's file. <laughs> used to get in trouble, though, because if I messed up, they knew who did it. Mm -hmm. So they'd come find me. But I was raised by 14 grown men on a sleeper bus or truck traveling from city to city doing concerts as a child. And then when my father, sometimes we'd be in a town I wasn't familiar with, he would take me to all the historical parts of whatever that city had to offer. I've been to museums in every town in the United States from Fargo, North Dakota, to Jacksonville, Florida, to the Goddard Space Museum in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, to the museum up in Seattle. So that was what my dad did. And if he couldn't answer a question, he'd say, let's go. i say, where are we going? He'd say, we're going to the library. Mm -hmm. So that was the kind of father I had who'd also cry in front of me. Mm -hmm. So I had this, I thought everybody's parents did this. Boy, was I wrong. But anyway, so I grew up in that kind of a, uh, environment, and by the time I got old enough to play myself, I start touring when I was 13. I'd lie about my age, you know, the mascara people <coughs> talk about making the mustache. You're and in getting, tremendous. Yeah. You're a bass player? Uh, no. Uh, drums, drums, and I started okay. with trombone and trumpet. Okay. okay. <clears throat> but I started touring on my own and, and writing music and also trying to play sports, because at the same time, I didn't need basketball players or someone as a role model. It was hard enough to pass muster in my own family. My uncle Dean was assistant dean of music at Michigan State. My father and my uncle both had master's degrees in music. When they drafted my uncle, they drafted him as assistant choral director at West Point. So it was totally crazy. And, you know, it was nuts, too, because I come from a mixed family, and uh, Grandpa Cecil and Grandma weren't quite into that until I was born. 
That's your mother's side or your dad's side? Uh, that's my dad's side. Okay. My grandpa was German and she was Corsican French. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to cuss in German and French. By the time I was five, I was fluent cusser mm -hmm. in both <laughs> languages. So then they start speaking Flemish, mm -hmm. Belgian. And now I know the worst words in Belgian. But anyway, we won't go into that. The, the deal is, is that I was exposed to all these things because that's the way that the, my family was. Mm -hmm. um, my father taught me how to cook and clean and, and take care of things. In other words, my mother didn't have a specified role that the female does these things. So I came up in an enlightened environment which they encouraged. So I, I act now the ways of, of my family. It's not that I have to think about it. And also I've learned that my role in life is to be in the service of others. I used to fight that, but now I understand that that's my calling. He asked you traveling as a young person, as a child, uh, with a group of uh, men in a band. Mm -hmm. uh, how did race come into your consciousness as a young child? Because you weren't traveling with the white, black band. No, no it, it was white with occasionally a few uh, right. uh, uh, black musicians. Mm -hmm. But it's funny because and, I have and a... And you went down south? Yes. And so what... what how so did they'd you... say I was Mexican. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of different places we went to where sometimes I had to stay in the bus okay. when they weren't quite sure. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it varied. And, and also for renting apartments. Here in Minneapolis, my father told my mother that she couldn't go with him when he had to rent an apartment. Uh, because some of the areas we lived in in Minneapolis wouldn't rent to a mixed couple or a black person. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember we lived in St. Louis Park a long time ago, not that far from Lake Calhoun. Where my father rented a place. When my mother came uh, and some relatives came to visit, we had a cross burned on our lawn oh, wow. the, the following Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I remember that very vividly mm -hmm. here in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have those uh, those memories, too. And the fact of, at that point, my mother and father said, you have to be worldly. You can't be neighborhoodly. Mm -hmm. He said, because we're connected to the world. If you're only connected to this place that does these things, he said, there's no future in it. I say the same thing in a different way. Uh, I tell the story about being a kid in Kansas City. Yes. And being told by mom and dad, you can go to the corner, and to the alley, down this block and that and back, but you can't cross any of the streets, right? And so, as a five-year-old, I said, my world was my neighborhood. Yes. Uh, fast forward uh, to, you know, the 60s, 70s, to technology, and now my understanding and my attitude is that uh, my neighborhood today is the world. Communications, technology, I know that you're expert in this, afford me the ability to connect with people all over the planet. And so the boundaries and the barriers of what neighborhoodism meant has totally inverted neighborhood now mm -hmm. is actually the planet Earth. What do you think about that? Well, not only do I agree with it, there is a slight uh, dichotomy in that between that and Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Because I find myself, you know, a first couple of years back here, uh, I'd miss Los Angeles because of the pace and because of the certain groups of people you, you acquire and have as friends over the years. Uh, I go back to Los Angeles, get off the plane, get in the car, and I'm on the 405 freeway, which is a famous freeway there, and I'm stuck in traffic. It seems like I'm in the same place I was the time I came a couple months earlier. So it's like, it's like deja vu. It's like, I'm missing this? <laughs> well, it's because all my family is sure. there. And then when I come back to Minneapolis and, and how calm the airport is and how easy it is to get out of there and to get home and to make it around, there's a bubble here. And that bubble here is the lilacs in the summer. It's the lakes. You know, a matter of fact, when a young man told me he lived in the ghetto and I saw his house, I said, have you ever been to bedford Stuy? I said, have you been to Soweto? But, but at that point, I also had to remind myself that it's a state of mind. Yeah. It's not always a, a, a physical situation, mm -hmm. and it's what you think of yourself. Yeah. So, uh, in other words, I've been worldly and exposed to all these things, but that doesn't always prepare you to deal with the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Because to come back to a neighborhood where if people aren't in love with themselves, they can't show you love. And I want to make our children, regardless of their color, in love with the fact that we are all relevant. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Hill a question, because when I went to uh, visit uh, Freedom School and saw the Harambe, uh, uh, I call it a celebration, mm -hmm. 
in the morning, I saw all kinds of races and ethnicities there. And it, it seemed to be less about Afro-American than it was, this is cool for these kids, period. So it, it's kind of, to me, transitioned from our, our, our uh, 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 southern thoughts, you know, because uh, I remember uh, uh, back in the civil rights movement, a lot of things were based upon um, what's happening in the South. And also, too, I know a lot of people that I came up with who were political at the time had complaints about the civil rights movement, especially about the black people that came from Minnesota, said that they were all too moderate, and that even Martin Luther King was not as moderate as some of the black people who came from Minnesota. And it, it's almost as if we found a way to coexist and everything was cool, so don't, let's not bother it. But when you got to Dr. King, who also people don't realize how many late now late night phone calls he had with Malcolm X right. and, and Stokely Carmichael and a lot of other people. It was about what's happening to us as a whole. Mm -hmm. And now since 2008, and even when the hippie movement came about, um, it, it, it's, it depends on which lie you listen to. Either there are differences between us and they're natural, or there's game of foot. And that game of foot affects all of us. You and after it. watching the lack of movement by the Congress mm -hmm. and not even realizing that you're blaming it on Obama, there's no such thing as president. Mm -hmm. He's the head of a cartel. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's just the job he has. So in other words, it, it came to a standstill. You'd rather watch the country fail mm -hmm. just so you can get your point in? That's not the America that I was told that I lived in as a child. So I see more things happening towards what I thought America was in St. Paul, in Minneapolis, or through the freedom schools, the intentions of the school board, and people in our community. So sometimes when I do leave the bubble of Minneapolis, folks are a bit more aware here of a lot of things than a lot of other places I go to. So basically this is a, 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 a high five. Mm -hmm. I'm actually, instead of trying to get back to L.A., all of a sudden being calmer with where I am because you've got to work wherever you are, right. especially if you're a person of color. But now, with not the point of trying to prove anything to anyone, but to make sure that all of us get a fair shake. Because that's what, what's happening to me that I see. It's all of us are, are going to hell in a handbag behind some activities that are happening from governments, whether it be ours or another, and that if if we have to make a move like I've seen happen here in St. Paul, then I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier, and I like my partnerships that I've just established. Dr. Hill, take off from there, if you would, on the question of partnership, and you've got some principles that guide uh, the uh, freedom schools, the CDF uh, freedom schools. Uh, high quality academic uh, enrichment, parent uh, and family involvement, social action, civic uh, engagement. Uh, you call it intergenerational servant leadership development, mm -hmm. and uh, you focus on nutrition and health and mental health. These are core yes. strategies that undergird the work that you do, the essential components. Uh, and that curriculum really builds community as well as, as building. Uh, the uh, character of individuals. We'll talk about that and bring that to the, the question of partnership, how important it is and what you want out of partnerships, how you drive partnerships to support your vision and your uh, charges, your students. Well, the integrated reading curriculum integrates social action, positive uh, conflict resolution, as well as high quality children's literature that affirms culture. It's multicultural, African-American as well as other cultures, uh, books, and the books are nonfiction, fiction, all kinds of genres written by primarily people of color. Mm -hmm. So it is culturally affirming. So we're learning the truth about each other. A Hmong man came up to me, one of the fathers, and said, Dr. Hill, we were hearing lies about African Americans. Mm. But now through Freedom School, we're seeing the truth. We're seeing the truth about each other so that we're not fighting and competing with each other, that we are truly a community coming and working together, affirming each other, 
knowing that all of us have been built and brought here for a purpose. And that purpose and gift that each of us have is comes together to surround and unfold our children with love. We're about loving our children to life, loving them so that they can overcome disparity, loving them so that they can come to community in truth and justice and work together. And that's what it's all about. Uh, we don't want to have communities where people are fighting and bullying. And, um, and so therefore, that's the whole thing about coming together as partners. Our parents, multicultural, coming together to hear about how we can best strengthen what's going on in the school instead of fighting and talking about it. We know that the schools can't do everything. So as parents, we come together with the school so we can um, let Amen. them know how we can support our children, how we can affirm them, how we can, we want to know what you're doing so that we can take it home and build up a, a college going culture in the hearts and minds of our children so that we can begin to build an atmosphere of academic progress and achievement in our children. And they can see examples of that through the curriculum at Freedom Schools. We also want to partner with the schools because we do know that we need to dismantle that cradle, that pipeline from the cradle to prison. We want to have a, a pipeline from the cradle to college and career. And it takes us working together with our educators, our teachers, our administrators to do that. And, and because parents as first teachers working together is the greatest predictor of academic success and future success than even the greatest teacher in the world. So that's where we come together as partnerships, put, pulling our resources together. We want our community to be involved. We want people from intergeneration and multicultural to come and to be involved and to create that world, like you said, that yes, we want to make sure that we are affirming and loving our community where we live, our neighborhoods, but there's also a world outside of that so that our children's imagination and vision is broadened that they know that they're special. You're, they, they're telling each other, I'm special, you're special. I won't harm you. Um, I'm going to treat you with R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Say what? R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And knowing what that means. Mm -hmm. And so partnership is very important because it does take a village to raise a child. It takes people for them to see working together. And so that's why the partnership is so important because we want, we know that we have great teachers at St. Paul Public Schools, but we want to support them. You talked about dismantling the, the cradle to prison pipeline. Uh, I, I suggest that uh, freedom, a, a freedom school objective, uh, a, a teaching objective of an Andre Fisher and of Julie Schultz Brown would be one that uh, dismantles white supremacy. Absolutely and supremacist thought, and that uh, we have to figure out a way to attack that uh, publicly, forthrightly, and in a way that doesn't engender fear mm -hmm. uh, in white people, mm -hmm. but that has clearly the objective of creating freedom mm -hmm. for white people and brown people and, mm -hmm. and every person, that the freedom we seek is a freedom that affords us all to be the very best human beings we can be, that we are in search of the mechanism for protecting and preserving and growing the notion of dignity in individuals mm -hmm. and culture. What do you think? Well, if we don't do that, the term American means what? That has to happen because that's what we're made up of, people from everywhere. Mm -hmm. I don't see thousands of people leaving here to move to a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. Now, some may do it who need a different tax status, and a lot of corporations that put their main offices somewhere else. So I'm talking about people. And what you just mentioned, it's just like when you said supremacy. Usually, um, who's ever running it, whatever it is, rewrites history. That's why your history won't get in it if you didn't win. Okay, if I'm part of the team, you'll mention me. Mm -hmm. All right, so... What happens, as far as I'm concerned, is, is that um, for the word American to mean something, it means that us as all these races and all of these principles
principalities, meaning all these governments and all these cities and towns across America, there has to be some uniting activity. And that activity, uh, sorry to say at times, just like a science fiction movie, is usually when the earth is threatened, we all hang out together. Yeah, right. You know, we all sing we Kumbaya, you know. It, but, Listen, we're out of time. Right. This has been a great conversation. Uh, Andre Fisher, who is the uh, executive director of Twin Cities Mobile Jazz Project, former dean of music industries at McNally Smith College of Music, uh, Julie Schultz Brown, communications director for the St. Paul Public Schools. Thank you for being here, you. and the Reverend Dr. Darcel Hill, the executive director of the St. Paul Freedom School. This is an important conversation. I want to carry it further because I think uh, we've got a lot to talk about, and I think that our listeners and our viewers uh, want to hear this kind of engagement because we're touching things that will change community, change society, and make America the America we want. Join me again next time for Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you. Here's a quick insight to health tip or workout you can do at home. Whether you're cleaning, whether you're just walking around the backyard, pick up your pace. If you do something for 20 minutes and getting your heart rate up, you're gonna burn some calories. And again, although we'd like to have you in the gym, if you can't find the time, you always have 20 minutes in every day. A quick tip from Open City's Health Center on how to lower your blood pressure. Eat foods with uh, less salt. Um, you're trying to exercise, um, avoid alcohol, avoid uh, tobacco, um, and try and get on a regular sleep schedule, um, and try to manage your stress. Quick insight to health tip. Guys, you want to make sure you have water in your system. One thing we do at the Fit Lab is make sure that people bring water and we charge them for water whether they don't have it or not. Reason being is you have to prepare. If you don't prepare for your day, nutritionally, and have water in your system, it's not going to happen. Drink water, eat healthy, live good. We got to say goodnight. We want to thank Alan McFarland for bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests, all the guests in the house. Everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning, right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play you a song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a robust conversation. Because this thing is safe. The message is clear. Everybody knows we got to give it life.